The spot is literally about two foot off my rod length here. And uh, there's about seven or eight fish just sitting, just back off the spot. The spot's glowing a bit more now. Um, I think they've taken most of the feed. It's sort of sunbathing at the moment, that's the thing. So uh, it's the opportunity now is prime time to actually lower rig in. And then it's just a waiting game to see when they come back down this margin, which I'm sure they will do pretty soon. So I'm going to lower the rig in now. Obviously there's no fish there to scare, so it's perfect time. Just going to fish a slack line. And then we can watch the fish coming in. Just mend the leg core or the line if there's anything need mending. So if you can see the main line at all, then you try and sort of lower it in the water if you can. That's trap set. Put a tiny bit of pellet on it. Give them something to home into. Oops. There's fish coming round now. It's typical. <laughs> He's coming straight in on the spot. Well, Ben's got loads of fish round there, really near to his baits, and hopefully when that sun drops down, they're going to start feeding. He's going to get a couple of chances. I'm just setting my stall out for my big hit sort of style of fishing, so I'm doing a few bags up now. After the break, we're going to look at how I clip my lines up so I can fish at the same range all the way through the session without using the marker float anymore. We're going to have a look at my spod mix as well and how I spod. Welcome back to Thinking Tackle. What I'm going to do now is get my rods marked at the right range so that I can recast all the way through the session without using the marker float. So I'm actually going to feel the lead hit the bottom and to help me do that I'm going to take off the safe zone flying back lead because that will dull the feeling because it's going to fly back up the line on the cast and the line won't be perfectly tight when the lead hits the bottom. So I'm just going to take that off for a second, stick that in my pocket and then cast this one just past the marker float and hopefully feel it hit a nice bit of soft bottom out there which indicates a little bit of silt. Right, okay. That's probably six, eight foot past the marker float. And what I'm going to do now is just clip up the line on the reel just to mark the distance. That's going to stop the line going any further past that point. And then I'm going to wind it in and rechuck it and just make sure that that's at the right range. Okay, so I'm going to have a, another go just past the float, hopefully. Right, that was actually too far, so I'm going to take the line out of the clip, wind down a little bit so the line's tight to the lead and then put it under the line clip again. It's important to get all this sort of stuff right now because once I start getting bites, I can put it back out there on the same spot again and again and again. So by taking a little bit longer at the start of the session, it means that, that during the session you're going to get more bites. Right, so now I've got the first one clipped up at the range. I'm going to put the flying back lead back on again. Because the insert in the middle of the flying back lead has got a slit in it, and the metal piece has as well. I can just clip them back on the line without having to cut it. And then that's going to pin my line down on the lake bed when I'm actually fishing and hopefully stop the fish from knowing that I'm actually here. So that's the plastic piece on, the metal piece goes on as well, push the two together and the flying back lead's back on again. So that's that rod done. I'm going to repeat the process on the other two rods and I'm actually going to fish them all very close to the marker float. The middle rod's going to go slightly past and the other two rods are going to go about level with it. 
So I've got that sort of formation, like a, a sort of arrow head. So hopefully whatever way the fish come in, they're going to hit a rig before they hit the line. So I'm going to get the other two done now, and then we're going to have a look at my spod mix. Okay, the first two are out. Fortunately, they've gone out first time, just either side of the marker float out there. This is the third rod at the same range as well. And what I'm going to do when they're all out there, I'm going to get a little bit of electrical tape and just fold it over the line just in front of the butt eye to mark the distance I'm fishing so that when I recast later on in the session, I can get the tape in the same place and know I'm in the same distance. So let's just get this one out there now. I'm going to cast it quite hard because I've got a heavy crosswind here. And I'm aiming just at a, at a gap on the far bank so that I can get this out again at night and know it's in the same spot. That's it. Take the line out of the clip and then just sink it down against the wind. This electrical tape is nothing special. You can get it in any hardware store or electrical store. This is actually my lucky one because I nicked it off a mate of mine, Terry. So I'm just going to cut a little bit of that off of there and then just literally fold it over the line. Let it stuck on the line like that and then just fold it over so it sticks to itself. Like that and then literally just cut off the excess so it doesn't catch when I cast. And that's it, the line's now marked, so once I get a bite, I'll cast the rig out away from the spot, I'll get that bit of tape in a very similar position, I'll put the line under the clip on the reel, wind it back in, put my bag on, and then cast it at my marker on the far bank, it'll hit the clip, and the rig will drop in almost exactly the same position. And that is the difference between getting one bite in these sort of sessions and getting half a dozen bites. So now we've looked at how I clip my lines up, let's go on to my spod mix. So what I'm gonna do now is put my spod mix together. I favor like a mass baiting approach, so loads of different types of bait. That's the basis of it. That's my spod mix, which is hemp, and some other bigger particles, there's maple peas in there, there's wheat in there, uh, there's some maize in there as well. And basically, it's putting loads of different things out in the swim so the fish don't become preoccupied on one thing. So I'm going to put a few scoopfuls of that in there. What I do now is I make up my spod mix just enough to suit my first lot of baiting and then I'll carry on mixing it up again because I'm going to add some pellets to it as well and if you leave them in there over a long period of time the pellets will go to mush and they'll never actually get to the bottom of the lake so I'm just going to put a few spoonfuls of that mix in with virtually no water with them I've cooked these myself I've cooked them in really really salty water and that brings out all the flavours in them to that I'm going to add some pulse boilies which I've chopped up in my vegetable chopper so I'm going to put the whole lot of those in there. Again, it's another attractor. It's another size of food as well. So they're going to go in to that mix. I feel like a TV chef doing all this. There you go. And then the next one is my bloodworm and snail pellets. Really, really effective. Fish absolutely love these. And like I say, if you leave these in there too long, they'll just go to mush. So I'm just going to put a few in We'll spot those out and then I'll do another mix later on if I'm going to put more bait in. So we'll put a couple of those in there, like that. Give that a mix up. Now as this is, it's all going to fly out the back of the spot. As I cast the bait rocket out, a lot of it's going to come out the back. So I need to stodge the whole mix up a little bit so it holds in better. And you simply do that by adding a bit of ground bait. And this is a bloodworm ground bait which is similar to the pellets, so I'm just adding to that attraction again. It forms a cloud in the water, and I don't lose any out the back of my spod, because you want everything that you're casting out to get out to where the fish are feeding. So one more of those, I reckon, should be enough. Into there. And straight away, that's starting to stiffen up just a little bit. I'm going to press it down into the spod with my finger, to hold it in there that bit better and then once it's in the water it's going to break up fall out of the spot and put some bait on our spot for us so it's literally as quickly as that that's it done 
really, really carpy. Loads of different flavours, loads of different attractives, loads of different sizes of food, and hopefully that's going to get these fish rooting about on the bottom for absolutely ages. And the longer in, they're in the swim feeding, the more chance you've got of catching one. So let's have a look at how I spot. Before I actually start putting some bait in, I'm going to talk you through the kit I'm using. If you haven't seen one before, this is a spod. We've not used it in the series so far. It's basically a rocket tied on the end of a spare rod, which carries the small bait out to the spot, drops it because it's buoyant at the end there, all the bait falls out the bottom, and then I wind it back in and repeat it. So this is called a Skyliner spod, very bright nose cone, so it's really easy to see. It's got fins at the front of it, which keeps it up in the air longer, so it casts a long way. And it's got some stiff tails on the back of it, and that makes it much easier to wind it in, just like the large holes in it. The rod itself and the reel are specifically for spodding. It's called a spod rod, so it's much heavier than a normal carp rod. It's maybe four pounds test curve. The reel is a spodding reel, which winds in really, really quickly, and that's loaded up with braided reel line. Just like on my marker rod, I've got braid, this time it's actually for casting rather than feeling anything. On my marker rod it's for feeling the bottom, but this is for casting. It's only a 20 pound braided line, so I've got a 30 pound braided leader which takes the force of the cast, and then that 20 pound line flies off the spool really effortlessly, and it means I can spot a long way really, really easily. So what I'm gonna do before I put any bait out, is I'm gonna just cast the spot on its own. It's, it's heavy enough to get it out to that sort of distance where the float is, and then I'm gonna clip it up like I did with my fishing rods, wind it back in and then start baiting up. So let's get that out there. Okay, that's just about the distance I want to be going. I'm going to let a little bit more line off and then, as always, put it under the clip on the spool like that so I can't cast any further than that distance. And I'm just going to wind the line back in tightly through my fingers because there's no weight to the spod. There we go, get it up to the surface. It's really important when you're spotting to have everything to hand. So the bait's right in front of you. So you're not keep turning around away from the lake all the time. And it's important to get into a rhythm. That's how you're gonna get accurately. So here we go, first one, slightly into the wind, hits the clip and lands just behind the float. Now, the thing a lot of people do wrong with spodding is they wind it in far too quickly. You've got to give that bait time to actually fall out of the spod, otherwise you end up with a trail of bait on the way in. As you wind it in, it will flush all the bait out and the bait will be all over your lines and the fish are feeding around your lines. So I'll just give that a little flick. He's just gone round the float a little bit. That's it. Flick the line up off the surface and then just wind the spod in at a constant pace. When you're spotting at real long range, reels like this one that wind in really quickly make the job so much easier. So up to my hand, another spot full of stuff. I'm pressing it down with my finger inside so I don't lose any out the back. And then I'm straight back out to that float again. I'm hitting the clip every time and everything's just falling right by the float, directly over the top of the rigs. Give it a little flick, lift the line off the surface and back she comes. And that's the beauty of braided reel line as well, because it floats, it's really easy to pick the line up off the surface. I'm gonna put about 15, 20 spod falls out because there's loads of fish around. I'm not fishing right in the middle of them on purpose so I don't scare them. I'm going to set my stall out and hopefully later on this evening it's going to start happening. I've learnt from all the underwater filming that I do that spotting creates a cloud effect in the water and it's really really attractive to all species not just carp so I'm going to put a fair bit out to make sure that some of it ends up on the bottom where the carp are going to feed on it. And it's amazing how quickly the fish will come in to an area once you start putting some spod mix out there. It's far better than just using boilies on its own. All those different particles and smells and everything draw the fish in that much quicker. And we've noticed that we've baited spots with boilies, left it for several hours, nothing's happened. We've thrown some spod mix in and they've come straight in because of that cloud effect in the water. So, if you don't spot at the moment, 
you should really get involved in it. You don't have to spend a lot of money on your kit. You can buy spod rods for under a hundred pounds, spod reels for the same. And once you get into it, just like me, you probably won't ever fish without it. Okay, well that's about 15 spod falls. That's enough to start off with. Hopefully I'm gonna get a bite over that lot. What we're gonna do now is send the cameras back round to Ben's swim and you can have a look at the baits that he's using right in the edge. Right, the fish have actually moved out of this little bay at the moment. They followed the sunlight out into uh, the main part of the water. There's a couple of little sort of uh, gravel spots out there and uh, I've chucked a rig on there to see if we can get one while they're passing to and fro. At this point, I'll take you through some of the baits that I'm actually using today. The first is the good old sort of classic trout pellet. It's, um, it's a winner really, all carp like trout pellets and it's very oily and the, this sort of time of year when the fish are I've woken up from the springtime and they're well into feeding. Trout pellets are an awesome little fish catcher. Then they've sort of gone to the sort of hemp seed. Everyone, this doesn't need any introductory at all. It's, it's, it's an awesome fish catcher. Uh, again, don't use too much, especially in the edge. It's different when you're baiting far out, it's sort of at range and stuff. You, you maybe afford, or you think you can afford to put a bit more bait out. But like hemp seed, you only need a little handful and just spread it around the swim. Then I sort of go on to the boilies really and uh, I've got two different types. I've got my sort of red ones and I've got, got these ones here which are basically they're, they're made up with tuna in it, real tuna, which is uh, something that I've been using in the last six months and certainly this time of year it sort of comes into its own. The fish really, really like it. I've got some uh, cylindrical ones and some round ones, mainly just for different shapes and sizes and you can break them in half and spread them around the swim. This one's the Indian Spice, it's got a lot of garlic in it and it's a good it's a good fish catcher, it catches on some really hard waters as well, so you know, it's, it's a nice smelling bait. And on recommendation really that I've, I've been told to bring fluoros. Uh, these baits in particular have caught thousands and thousands of carp. They're bright, they smell, and for single hook baits they're absolutely awesome, they really are. So I've got an array of these and fingers crossed, I've got one of these on at the moment and fingers crossed the, thing, the fish will actually take it on that spot. Next thing really is uh, real tuna. I've been using this again a lot in my PPA bags and uh, just a tiny bit in with the boilies and again the sunflower oil it doesn't break down your PVA bags at all and it is a good fish puller so it does pull them down onto the bottom of the lake. Next I've got like some hydrostrim which is basically aminol. Uh, it's a, a fish extract and again that can go in on soaking on your pellets. That's another real good addition to your pellets, it's awesome. So uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, try and catch a fish before it gets dark, before I set up camp for the night. And uh, after the break, I'm going to show you some of my rigs. Welcome back. This is day two. As you can see, the conditions have gone all overcast and rainy now. Yesterday it was all high pressure and sunny and a lot of the fish were on the surface. Now it's perfect. I've baited a few spots around the edge again. And I've actually got fish on all of my spots. I camped up last night and had two carp. I lost one this morning, a good fish. And I caught an eel as well. Probably about four or five pound. The fish are right underneath my feet at the moment. Got a really good chance. They're bubbling up and probably about six or seven fish down there. One fish in particular, which is a really good fish, about 30 pound mark. So fingers crossed, we'll get a take in a minute. Fish is down there still feeding, but because I put a lot of small bits in, they're taking their time and taking the hook bait. So I've started introducing a few bigger bits. So fingers crossed we get a bite pretty quickly. Thank you. 
gone. Off you go. Smallest one of the lot. <laughs> Sorry, damn it. Smallest one of the lot, but still good fun. I believe this is one of the uh, little stockies that Chris Logston's been putting into the lake. Pretty little fish. Um, not exactly what I came for, but uh, the one next door, door to it would have done. It was three times the size of this. But then there's not a lot you can actually do, really. It's uh, when you've got so many fish down there competing. But a welcome prize, nevertheless. Lovely little fish. We are into a fish, not long after Ben's had his one. And it's a grass carp, a great big one. I thought it was a grass carp. These are fish are uh, notorious for not doing a lot when you're playing them, but doing absolutely loads. Oh, <laughs> you pulled me in there. Absolutely loads when they go in the net, they try and jump out the net. Great big grass cart this is. I thought it was a grass cart when it uh, when it surfaced. I saw the shape of the tail. They're completely different from a normal carp. They they look more like a chub to me than a carp. And they do love the particle baits that I've been putting in. Now, just keep them underneath those other lines. Try and do the clutch stick a bit, but they really do charge about when they get close in these fish. Now, I can't net him. I can't net him in this net down here because I've already got a fish in it from earlier on. Oh, he's getting tired now. There he is. rod as low as I can and try and keep them underneath these lines again. Grass carp are notorious for doing really long runs and then coming in like a sack of potatoes and then going off on a run again. Even trying to throw the hook. Right, I think he's going to be ready now. Now watch when he gets in the net because they often try and jump out the net. Got him. And there it is, 29 and a half pounds of grass carp, almost as ugly as I am. Um, not what we're fishing for, but very welcome all the same. They're quite hectic nights fishing. Uh, I've had five carp, lost a few as well. The baited spot's certainly working now. I'm keeping the spod going out. Every fish I catch, I'm putting three or four more spodfuls out and I'm getting bites fairly quickly. So I've created like a feeding area out there. All the rods are fished at the same range all on pretty much the same rigs and I'm getting consistent action now and hopefully with the weather the way it is with the rain and everything and being overcast that's going to continue all the way through the day so get this fella back these take a bit of oh let's put him down these take a little bit of nursing when they go back in because they do tend to wear themselves out in the fight and you have to sit with them in the edge for a little while just to make sure they go off nice and strong but look at that that is 
one prehistoric monster. Pucker. Let's get him back and then uh, have a look at the rigs that I'm using. Let's keep this little fella in the net for a little while just while we get the camera kit sorted. He's basically roared off just after we put that big old grass cart back. Fought like an absolute demon. Actually came on the right hand rod this time. Most of the bites are coming on the middle rod but because that wasn't even in the water, the right hand rod's roared off. So I'm obviously keen to get the rods back out again. The old constant baiting's working. Just putting three or four spodfuls in every time I get a bite and it's drawing these fellas back in again onto the spot. So we'll get this fella back and then let's have a look at my rigs in more detail. Stunning. Well, I know uh, we promised to show you some rigs, but no sooner has this gone back out again, I've put a bit, little bit of bait in and we're in again. Surprise, surprise on the middle rod. Um, I'm fishing them all even closer together now. This does actually feel like it's either a good fish or it's caught. I think it's caught in that other line. Basically the fish is caught in the other line because I'm fishing all the rods so close together. Fortunately at the moment the line is round the flying back lid and not, hasn't slid down towards the hook link which could easily pull the hook out. So Ben's just opening the bail arm so the line's coming back from the other rod and if it stays round that flying back lid I should get the fish in. Fortunately he's not going mad. I can see the line round the flying back lid. What can happen here is the lead on the other end of the line can get caught and uh, it will stop coming towards us but he's just inch by inch coming towards us now this fish fortunately. It's right round the, the uplink now. See if I can get him in a bit lively. Come on baby. Yes, got him. There he is. Another very pretty tiller mirror. Hopefully uh, we're going to catch his mum later on, so we'll put this one straight back and get on with those rigs. Welcome back to Thinking Tackle. While we're getting the lull in the action on the rods, we're going to show you those all important rigs. So this is the rig that I've been using throughout the session. It's basically designed as a result of all the underwater filming that I've done. And what we've noticed in some of the more recent films is the very big, very cute fish are actually sucking the bait in and blowing it back out very, very quickly. And there's no indication on the rod end at all. So I've changed the rig around a little bit to hopefully combat that. The main thing I've done is put a little tiny micro rig ring on the back of the hook rather than using a bit of silicon tubing. And what that does is it allows me to fish the hair very, very short so the bait and the hook are close together. So hopefully if the fish do just suck that bait in just a bit, the hook's going to go in with it. The other advantage of the ring is that it will help the bait to slide out of the way as the hook penetrates. So the hook goes further and further in rather than the silicone getting in the way. Now the bait is my old favourite 12mm dumbbell hook bait, the bloodworm type. And then I've got a bit of fake corn on the end that I've soaked in a bit of pineapple flavouring. So you've got the best of both worlds. You've got something really smelly and attractive in the bloodworm and something very visual in the fake corn as well. On the end of the hook there I've got a little bit of shrink tubing and that's just going to help the hook to flip over and catch hold in the fish's mouth. A little bit of the exposed braid inside the hybrid material that helps the hook lift up and then turn and catch hold and then as you can see a very short hook link. I favour short hook links because when the bait goes in the mouth you want the hook link straight as quickly as possible and the fish feeling the weight of that lead so probably a three or four inch hook link. I've got a link loop actually crimped onto the end there I'm using a special carp crimp to put that on the end. That's covered up by the bit of silicon at the moment and then that's attached to a quick link so I can take my hook links on and off very easily and also attach one of my favourite PVA sticks as well with the tuna mix in it. Just a standard lead clip system, three ounce flat swivel pair lead, the bottom's not too soft out there, I'm filling that down onto the bottom okay. A rubber connector just to neaten it all up and then one of the clay coloured safe zone leaders to pin everything down on the lake bed and hopefully blend in as well as possible. So that's the rig that I'm using on this session. It's something that I use most of the time now because I find it so effective. It is very, very easy to tie. And now you've seen it 
from head to toe, hopefully you'll be able to put it into your fishing as well. Well, just to prove that the rigs I'm showing are working, we're in again. Feels quite a decent fish, you're just keeping nice and low in the weed. Just feel that like the line just ticking through the bits of weed as he comes in. Not really doing a lot, which is a good sign. During a session like this, I could end up getting through 20, maybe even 30 rigs. So I can't understand why people use really complicated rigs that take a long time to tie, because as soon as that hook's not perfectly sharp anymore, I want to change it. It's great fun in this clear water watching them twist and turn on the line. Once I get this one in, I should be putting a few more spodfuls out just to draw those fish in. It's something I've learned from the underwater filming. As soon as you put a little bit more bait back in the swim, the fish come in and start having it again. And you can really work the swim up to a frenzy. Come on, baby. Yes, got him. There he is. Another very pretty chilling mirror. Good little fight off this fella. Same rig as normal with the old ring on the end. So I'm going to hand you over to Ben now and he's going to talk you through the rigs that he's been using for fishing in the edge. Let's get this fella back. Now we're on the important bit, the rigs. I'm going to run you step by step through what I use. First of all, I've got 45 pound lead core. I come down to a one ounce dumpy square pear lead. Then I've got a soft rubber shock leader sleeve, which is really important. I've kicked the hard insert out, taken it away, and replaced it with this sleeve itself. We then go down to a link loop, and the big end is joined to the lead core, and the thin end, the flush end, goes down to my hook length. This, the hook length itself is 15 pounds stealth skin. And half of it, from here down to here, has been removed, the skin itself. So it's just the braided bit underneath. We then go down to the bottom part of the rig. We've got a tiny bit of putty here just to pin everything down. Then we come onto the hook itself. It's a size 8 wide gate. I've got a tiny bit of shrink tubing which kicks the hook over. Just flips the hook when it enters the fish's mouth a little bit easier. Then I've got a hook bead on the shank of the actual hook itself. This keeps the hair in line with the back of the hook. And what I've done is I've put a tiny, tiny little PVA bag with about five pellets in. And I've hooked that on and then threaded the hair through the back of it and put the boilie on itself. This just keeps the hair straight from the back of the hook to the boilie. So it can't wrap round or anything when you're lowering the rig in the water at all. Just keeps everything nice and clean, simple. And often you only get one chance to lower a rig in. And uh, you don't want to be doing it two or three times because you could scare the fish off that you're trying to catch. Right, there's a twist to this rig. It looked very simple when I showed you it. And I'm going to run you through how I set this rig up. What I do is I poke the splicer needle through the soft sleeve open the gate latch, and just above the knot, I close the gate latch. I then pull the hook length back through the rubber insert. So now what you've got is half the hook length inside the rubber sleeve itself. I then pull the lead down onto the sleeve and that's the rig itself cocked. As you can see, it's only like two inches. What I do then is just pull the bit of putty, and if you remember right, I took the skin off halfway up the hook length. So I put it to just where the join is, and remend the putty. Now what happens when you've got fish feeding tight on the bottom? Obviously you want a tiny little hook length, but you want this rig to extend when you're playing the fish because you don't want the lead around the fish's mouth causing mouth damage. So the beauty of this rig 
is once the fish takes that bait and bolts off, all the hook length slides back out. Now, the idea obviously with the soft sleeve is just it makes everything fish friendly so it can all pass over the knots. So if you snap up, again, you're not hurting the fish. Let's go and put this rig to the test, see if we can catch one. Now I've shown you the rigs. We're back to the same spot that I stuck one out yesterday. There's some real good ones down here again. Same sort of size, mid-twenties. There's some small fish in there, so it's going to be difficult to pick the fish out itself. I'm feeding the swim up a little bit, bit by bit. I've got to get a rig in yet. And the fish are right, right at my feet at the moment. So by chucking a few pellets a little bit further out, it pushes the fish back down the shelf and maybe gives me sort of 50 to 60 seconds to lower my rig in. Excellent, we've just took one. A little bit of a scrap on our hand. Unfortunately, you never know here whether or not it's a big one or one of the little ones. No, my luck today. It's one of the small ones. Oh well. Yeah, it's the one with the kink tail. Whee! Excellent. You can see the deformity in the back of its tail. It might have well been dropped. It could have just been like that all its life, but I think. I think it's probably been dropped. That's where you sort of uh, got to be really careful with your mats and everything and how you look after the fish. Awesome little common carp. Character as well. Come on, baby. Oh. Gotcha! Come on, pucker. And there we have it, another superb Chillum common carp. Well into 20 pounds, this one. But over a dozen fish fishing out there in the middle. So it's been really good to show you how to do that. And obviously, it's really nice to have Ben on the show and show you how to catch him right in the edge. So we're going to get this fella back and hopefully see you on the banking show six where we might even do a bit of floater fishing. For a chance to see more of the underwater footage shown in this series, check out the state-of-the-art underwater carp fishing series, available from all good tackle shops. Thinking Tackle, brought to you in association with Picture Canning Company, making television happen.